Agency's Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps you deliver beautiful proposals in the cloud and close more deals. Welcome to the 36th episode of Agency's Drinking Beer. And on today's show, we're going to be talking with Thomas Rankin and Michaela Atkinson about how they pivoted their Instagram marketing business. Cool. So we have an interview coming up very soon with Thomas and Michaela from Dash Hudson. You guys should enjoy that. They're going to tell us how they uh, automate a lot of their sales for their um, for their Instagram marketing business. Cool little story. Thomas is good. Um, I just met Michaela. I'm sure she's good too, but I've known Thomas for, for quite a while, a few years. Um, so, you know, I started telling you about this yesterday and, and we actually had to re-record it. So let's talk about it now. Let's talk about um, the idea of constraints inspiring creativity. You were kind of distracted yesterday when I was telling you about that. I was having some technical issues. Yeah. yeah. I'm ready to Some though. testicle I'm ready issues. To now. So, that too, yeah. Um, so what I was talking about was I'm actually reading a book right now by Biz Stone. We, you love his name. The I, uh, co-founder yep, of Twitter. Yeah. Stage name. Yeah. <laughs> he came back to Twitter recently, actually, as the CEO. He was never the CEO before. He was always, uh, he was a co-founder of Twitter, but uh, it was, oh, it's, what's his name? I should know this. Anyway, the guy who, the developer, anyway, became the CEO back in the early days. But um, the really cool thing about Biz Stone's book, it's called Things a Little Bird Told Me. And it's just about how he's created his own opportunities in life and his story of, like, just sort of, taking chances and doing things and he's been like deep in debt and had no money and he's just you know gone and done these things and it's amazing how his life turned out because of it and a lot of it had to do with his creativity he's a very creative person and uh, he actually was a designer at a bookshop by accident he was like moving boxes there or something and he was working at this place called Little Brown and it was a, a, a design firm that did book covers for publishing companies and he just saw like somebody's computer open while they went to lunch and he just sat down and started designing you know an, a book cover and threw that in the pile of ideas and they ended up selling that to the client and the client picked his idea and they were like who the fuck did this and it was him so they gave him a job and so he he like interned and, wow. and he was uh you know he had a mentor there who owned the company who kind of showed him the ropes about design and one of the things that he taught him which is kind of a, a classic you know, idea in design is that, you know, design is not art because art is just, you know, completely your own personal interpretation of something and you, there's no constraints. You can do whatever you want, but the idea of design and how it's different is that you're, you're constrained by something. <clears throat> if you're designing something for print, it might be the page size. It might be, um, you know, you, you're, you're, you're restrained to two colors because they don't have enough money for a four color job or there's all kinds of reasons why there's always constraints put upon you when you design something. Um, but you know, his point is that constraints, when you have constraints, you actually can be more creative within that space. So if you like stare at a blank page and just say, draw something, it's very hard to come up with something. But if somebody says, draw a tiger, you could come up with a hundred ways to draw that tiger. And so that idea kind of translated into Twitter and limiting the amount of characters kind of forces you to be more creative within that. So I thought that was a really cool, cool thing. I like it. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. One of the ways that I've been trying to apply that, and uh, so far it's not going too well, but I'm, I'm trying to stick with it. It's only been three days. So what I'm trying to do is I find that I, I get very sidetracked easily throughout the week. I've got a whole pile of things I want to do, and it could be marketing related or product related or whatever. And I don't always get the things done that I want to at the end of the week. So what I'm trying to do now as an experiment is give each day of the week a theme. And so that I can only, it's like my kind of personal restraint. So if it's Monday and that's content day, then it doesn't matter if I feel like writing a blog post that day. That's, I'm writing a blog post. So by putting those constraints, but you know, Tuesday might be, you know, uh, outreach day where I'm kind of like getting through emails and reaching out to influencers and day three is product day or Wednesday, um, growth day, you know, I'm, so I'm trying to kind of give myself, like put myself in a bit of a box for each of those days so that it forces me to get through the work because then I can look at the end of the week and see, oh, okay, I've, uh, I've accomplished 
all these different things in these different areas. And I didn't just spend the week doing kind of what I was inspired by at the time. Which, you know, sometimes inspiration is a good thing. Depends where you're at and what you're <clears throat> working on. Mm -hmm. If you're working just slowly on the business and have some deliverables and time timelines, this makes a lot of sense. But if you're going into design mode, creating something, mm. you gotta kind of, you can't force it. It's like forcing yeah. a song when you're writing a song. You just can't. Sometimes it just doesn't come, and you just gotta, you know, you have writer's block. Or, but I, I get what you're saying. I mean, from a, from yeah. a production standpoint and, and for efficiencies, it makes a lot of sense. I try to do the same thing. Not quite as regimented, but I do try to set aside time. Say, okay, I got to work on this. Yeah, big time. Well, it's because sometimes I think uh, I, I agree. You got to kind of like strike when the iron's hot, and when mm -hmm. you're feeling inspired by something, it's a good time to do it. But I think it's too easy to kind of just go with the wind and do whatever you, you're feeling like. Because then sometimes, it, like for instance, one thing that I want to do more of is more um, more kind of outreach online and trying to like create relationships with new people that could be influencers, that could be partners, it could be whoever. Right. And I kind of hate doing it. So by kind of forcing myself to do it, it's sort of, it's mm. I can't do anything else at that day. But I think, you know, when you're inspired by something, that's where Evernote and stuff like that comes in handy because especially blog post ideas or, like, new product ideas, it's like I have, I've had it so many times where I just I get an idea for something when I'm, like, in the shower or, like, right before I go to bed, and then I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. And then the next, within minutes, I forgot what it was. That happens to me daily. I swear to God. I think yeah. of this great idea or something and just gone. I can't think. I just can't remember. I just thought it was because of my age, but I'm glad it happens to you too. That's why we have these phones on us all the time, and they've got notes, and they've got little audio recorders. I know. i got to be better at that. i got to use Evernote. Mm. I mean, I use it a bit, but I've got to get be diligent about it. Yeah. I and mean, even, um, not Evernote, but just the voice memos can yep. be good, too, because it's True. easier. You don't have to, like, fuck around with it. You can yep. just create a, just, like, start recording. Oh, cool. i got an idea for this. Put it down. It's a good idea. I remember it. Yeah. Anyway, let's. Uh, I'm gonna maybe report back in a couple of weeks and see how this experiment work. If I have been more productive, um, because then, then if I do, I can write a blog post about a, a productivity hack. Mm. People love that shit. They do. Yeah. So dot biz underscore stone. Um, I'll have to check out his stuff. Oh, it's a really good book. Yeah, and it's it, it, there's a lot of cool stories in there. Maybe I'll share more in the next week uh, as I keep reading the book. Really cool thing about uh, the fail whale. You remember a few years ago, Twitter went down all the time. Oh yeah. And I always had the fail whale. It was this graphic of a of a whale being held up by little birds. So people would always see the fail whale. That's what they called it, the fail whale. It was like the weird down page. Nice. Um, he's got a story about that. It's a really cool book. Check it out. Things a little bird told me. Um, so we're going to now move on to the interview with Dash Hudson. Ooh. I'd like to welcome Thomas Rankin and Michaela Atkinson to uh, the podcast. Thanks for being on, guys. Hey, thanks so much for having us here. <laughs> Good to be here. So uh, Thomas and Michaela, uh, Thomas is the CEO of uh, Dash Hudson. And Michaela, you are the sales manager? I'm a brand strategist, but I mainly work on our automated sales process, and I do some marketing as well. So uh, I know, I've known uh, Thomas for a few years, and uh, Dash Hudson's a really cool product. It's a very interesting story of how you guys kind of started and, and how you pivoted over the years. So what did, tell me what Dash Hudson started as. <laughs> a simple idea. Um, so yeah, my co-founder and I kind of had this original vision that, you know, commerce was going to change and that commerce was going to be driven through mobile and through, um, kind of organic photos. Like it wasn't going to be like a picture in a catalog. It was going to be kind of a picture of you or I kind of thing. Maybe not you, but maybe me. <laughs> <All of> me. <laughs> or maybe Michaela. Oh, cause you're, um, you're more me. stylish yeah. than me. Is that <laughs> yeah, it? That's it. Featuring the product. And we, you know, we saw a lot of challenges with that. We thought in the beginning that we were going to kind of be the end point, meaning we were going to be the retailer of choice. So what we started with was the original Dash Hudson, which was a mobile application that connected beautiful lifestyle content to the products that people would want to buy. And you could buy it through a really simple mobile one tap shopping cart. Um, you know, that was an adventure in and of itself trying to grow a consumer application, which is very, very difficult. Trying to grow out of trying to grow out of the 
you know, the app store is, is super tough. Um, I think especially in, in retail. Um, but we were trying like all kinds of crazy different things to try and grow the app. And one of the things that we tried was to leverage Instagram as a place to both acquire content and to acquire new users. So, um, we built some really cool technology that enabled us to basically make kind of a better shopping experience for Instagram and um, to move people on and off of Instagram um, using our technology. The I guess the thing we realized over time, especially after talking to more brands and talking to brand partners who were interested in what we were doing, was that the technology and some of the insights that we've developed that we had developed. Um, to better understand how well we were doing and using Instagram to be successful it was actually way more useful than the consumer app itself. So it was sometime last spring that we kind of started to package up all of these insights that we built in-house to measure our own performance and started showing them to brands. And we realized really quickly that that was the business. That's... That only took us like two years to figure that out. <laughs> um. So like, you know, in our case, we didn't really pivot because we just kind of had to stay on the track of where mm-hmm. we were going. But with you guys, it was like uh, part of the reason I think it's so interesting is that you you kind of started over here with a consumer app. You were using Instagram and, and measuring it. And then you kind of find, found out that's actually what people want. Mm-hmm. And so then you completely switch gears. Now you're going after the kind of people who, you know, need uh, to measure their Instagram marketing. So kind of who now would you say is your customer? Who are you going after? Yeah, so I mean, we work now with, um, we call them aspirational brands, but you know, they're brands that um, communicate with their customer through, again, kind of organic lifestyle content. So in the type of content that kind of makes people really want to be part of the brand. And our customers tend to be more focused on building that brand awareness and building brand engagement as opposed to kind of a direct response, just buy, buy now. Um, and our customers are investing in Instagram. So they're investing in creating content. They're investing in growing their audiences and getting distribution. And we essentially provide the insights and ROI measurement layer that ensures that they're doing a good job. There you go. So I'm going to reveal my, uh, my ignorance here. Sure. Uh, I don't, I don't really get Instagram. I, I have an Instagram account. I post yeah. uh, photos of food and my kids. Yeah. I put filters on them. Yeah. But I don't understand it as a marketing platform. Yeah. It's like you, they don't have links and it's you can't reshare stuff. Like how does Instagram work from a marketing standpoint? Like sure. who are the brands that are having success with that? Yeah. I mean um, <coughs> really I guess the way to think about Instagram is it's like a combination of a glossy magazine, like imagine like a Vanity Fair or a Vogue combined with a shopping mall, essentially, except the mannequins are everybody. (laughs) So, I mean, really what you're seeing is kind of like this concept of like distributed high quality photography um, and brands kind of coming together. And, you know, these amazing content creators are really, you know, creating beautiful photography featuring branded products. Some of that is um, you know, incentivized by brands. And in other cases, it's, you know, just purely organic. So it's really like interesting because it's a great place for brands to kind of be in front of consumers in a non-intrusive way. Um, brands themselves, um, you know, spend a lot of time ensuring that they have a great content feed on Instagram, because again, it's, it's almost like the new magazine or the new catalog. Like you're not kind of where at one point in time you would have spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars getting a page in a fancy magazine and, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars doing photo shoots for your catalog. Now you put those resources and time and it's a lot cheaper into creating content for Instagram where that and that really that's where people engage around your brand and your products. So I mean, more than any other social channel, it's really where you get a curated but yet still organic kind of view of the brand world. And it's really, from what we've seen, is that, you know, the engagement rates that brands get on Instagram um, are four to five times what they would get on any other social channel. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's there's a real kind of, there's a real opportunity for brands just to kind of continue to build that relationship with their audience. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's important. I mean, in, you know, the brands we talk to are across apparel, luxury, consumer electronics, beauty, travel, um, food, 
you know, that is a top priority for them. Uh, it, it was becoming a top for, priority for them last year, and it's a number one priority for them this year to be to be investing and growing on Instagram. So how, <clears throat> pardon me, how do you measure that growth? Like, I guess when you say that when there's more engagement on Instagram, is that in terms of likes, comments, or is there another metric in there that, that you measure engagement with? Yeah, there are a few KPIs that brands uh, who work with us look at. Um, and typically what it boils down to is, uh, you know, follower growth is obviously very important. So growth rates, um, engagement rates. So the likes and comments divided by the number of followers that you have, and they track that over time. Hmm. Um, you know, brand equity is really measured by your organic reach. So our platform enables brands to measure how many people that they're reaching through organic means. So people just kind of tagging them in photos or comments or using hashtags. And, you know, that's a critical one for brands because the organic reach of a brand is directly correlated to audience growth. And then audience growth and quality of content are really what kind of start to drive like success. So, um, yeah, we work with brands to really understand organic reach. Um, and it's a bit of, it's a bit of magic to kind of, um, you know, incentivize and spur organic reach. Um, but, you know, one of the ways that brands are doing that is through kind of just incentivizing people to create through, you know, hashtags and contests and things like that. But also by leading the charge by, you know, working with influencers, for example, to create content that is organic around the brand. And that's kind of what kind of sets the tone for what the brand kind of vision is going to be. And, and people kind of follow and step on that. Mm -hmm. So who would you say that with Dash Hudson, so you, you, you build software that essentially helps uh, these brands measure their, the impact of what mm -hmm. they're doing on Instagram. Who would you say would be your, your target audience? Like, so we know the kind of the brands, the types of brands mm -hmm. you're working with, but who would be that person that you go to to, to sell Dash Hudson to? Uh, like our contact in the company, like who do we sell to? It's typically the, um, it's two people. So, the, I mean, the... We have two, we essentially have two users and one decision maker, I guess, in the company, the um, which is actually really great. It's the use case for our product keeps growing, but um, it's typically the digital editor, so the person who's running the social channel itself. They they're a daily engager in our product, um, and then the usually a director of marketing or somebody who's doing marketing insights is using our product for from an insights perspective. Um, and this is at a, at a brand. And, um, and then the decision maker that we're selling to is usually a director or VP, um, kind of depending on where the pricing lands for that particular customer. Mm -hmm. So that's when we're doing brand direct on the agency side. It's typically, um, it's typically the insights team or people that, you know, so basically they're, they're using us to pitch new customers or to do reporting for existing customers. Mm -hmm. And then or it's the account teams who are helping run campaigns um, because we provide organic campaign measurement tools mm -hmm. as well. So this is actually something as an aside. I didn't even realize that agencies are big ones because you're going after kind of the New York market. I yeah. understand that they have an insights team. Like what is that? I've never <laughs> What is an that. insights team? I mean, an insights team is really just sitting back and looking at data, right? Like they're looking data. at data, big data. <laughs> they're looking at, um, they're looking at trends. They're looking at performance. They're looking at competitive positioning. Um, yeah. So big, you know, big agencies like, you know, a BBDO or even some of the boutique agencies like, a, um, you know, spring studios, like these guys and girls, like they look really closely at like what's happening. Like they really want to drill into the data and they use that to build, you know, build their business cases for working because they're working with major global brands. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there are, there are insights teams like and and you know insight strategy teams on on most at most of these firms now. So let's say you're working with a you know big New York agency. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're pitching a, a global brand. How would they use Dash Hudson to essentially do a pitch? Because you're saying it's not just working with clients. Yeah. It's pitching clients. It's getting clients. How would they do that? So they're basically with the Dash Hudson platform, we're able to bring them more data on the cust that, that customer, that brand's performance, and the brand will know itself. 
Um, and we can do it because of the way we collect and aggregate data, we can do it without kind of needing the authorization of the brand. So that's a huge advantage in and of itself for an agency, just more information. Um, and then they're really using that data to understand, you know, things like content performance, like what things is the brand doing, doing now that work and what things don't. Um, what, you know, campaign activities has the brand taken undertaken in the past that performed and what didn't. They can actually show them, you know, things that they may have done previously with another agency. They'll be able to show better you know, better and more accurate results on that campaign than the agency that ran it would have been able to themselves. Mm. Um, so it sounds like a great value prop right now is going to agencies and saying, like, do you want to leg up on your competitors? Absolutely, for a pitch absolutely. Until they all buy Dash Hudson, and then I guess <laughs> it's, it evens out the playing. Field. Yeah, yeah. But for right now, there's definitely a first mover advantage. Um, absolutely. Like, there's a huge delta between what we do and what is available in the, elsewhere in the market. So, like, the people who jump on it first are going to benefit from it. Um, and I say that with a straight face, um, but yeah, there's, it wasn't that straight. I'm smiling a little, um, yeah, but there's also, um, I mean, the other way that they use this is for competitive reporting. So we can do KPI level competitive reporting across, uh, global brands. And again, that just allows them to show where the brand is performing, where they're underperforming and what levers they can pull to you know, improve performance over time. Mm. So typically that's kind of in the pitch process where they're using it, uh, using us. And then, you know, after that, it really comes down to more kind of active management and campaign results and things like that. Cool. So one, one thing that I wanted to talk about, and we've, we've had many a lunch over this. Um, I don't know if that's proper grammar, but it is now. <laughs> many many a, lunch. a lunch over yeah. this, um, is the idea of, you know, sale systems and, um, when you're going out directly to sell an enterprise product, which mm -hmm. Dash Hudson is, it's very different from how you sell Proposify. Proposify is like selling to small, mid-sized businesses. Everything's very, you know, kind of drive traffic into a funnel, convert it to a mm -hmm. trial. There's, it's very hands-off other than support. Whereas you guys are much, you know, a much more high-touch sales. There's more outreach. So um, one really cool thing is that typically when we think about enterprise sales, we think of that high-touch you know, cold call, email, whatever, get people, you know, get a lead through the website and then follow up. But you guys have automated quite a bit of it. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, there's still, you know, there's still uh, a human element mm -hmm. to it. But at the same time, you've been able to collect leads and kind of move, move them mm -hmm. through the sales cycle in a more automated way. Do you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, so one of the, probably one of my biggest like anxiety moments as a founder was when we decided, kind of when Tomac, my co-founder, and I decided that we were going to transition from business to consumer to B2B because it meant that I was going to have to figure out how to do sales. And I had no idea what sales even meant. Like, you know, really, I had no idea other than buying a car from a sales guy. Like, I didn't know what sales was. But I knew that, obviously, it was important in enterprise. So, like, that was, like, a huge challenge. And, you know, I took it upon myself to just try and read as many blogs and you know, books and things like that over like a three month period, just to start to get a framework for what enterprise sales actually looks like. Um, and, you know, I remember reading a story by, uh, it was a story about Vidyard actually, who just announced a big funding round. Um, and Michael Litt talking about how they hustled kind of their first like 20 uh, enterprise customers. And it was really just like pure hustle. It was like finding a – they wrote a script that went out and found people who had video on their site and they collected that and he hustled them on Twitter or by email and whatever way he could. So I realized that, you know, to actually like – and there's because there's such a learning curve when it comes to sales um, that I knew we were going to have to tackle this new – completely new market with a new product at Velocity or else we just weren't going to make it. Um, so we started to just build – you know, lists of leads. And we kind of found some pockets of companies that we thought would be, you know, uh, the right types of customers for us. And we outsourced that list to, you know, Odesk and they built us like an email contact list. And then we literally just started, you know, reaching out to them through HubSpot in a pretty rudimentary way in the beginning. Like it was pretty manual. Like we had a few templates built, but um, that when would you say have, through HubSpot, you mean like the email automation? It wasn't automated though. It was manual. We were just right. using templates. So we were, we were pressing send on every email. Right. Um, and, and so basically our, our kind of goal was just to like talk to as many people as possible and like tackle the market, right. Just to try and get those first few customers. We, 
you know, everything was off in the beginning, like our, our product proposition was off, like the language we used was off, the pricing was off, like the customer we were targeting was wrong, like everything was wrong, but we learned because we went at it really, really hard. Um, and, you know, so by like first of September, we were doing like, you know, f- like five calls a day kind of thing, five to 10 calls a day. Um, that was interested people who emailed who'd, back. Yeah, who'd, yeah, who'd responded. Um, and then I guess it was, you know, Michaela joined us in October. October. And I guess over September and October, we'd kind of started to learn. We'd hired our head of uh, brand strategy, Mariana, who's based in New York in August and she was helping us kind of better position where we were going and really helping figure out pricing and we were listening to customers so we were building out the feature sets at like a rapid pace like we were launching a feature a week and just actually trying to build a product that was like suitable for like these customers Mm -hmm. and you know but then it was like when we started when all the pieces started to come together Michaela joined and that's when we kind of started to look more closely at at automating the sales process and I mean Michaela can tell you a bit about about what we do now. Um, yeah, we'd love yeah. to hear from Michaela. Of course. You've been quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thomas has a lot to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I basically have found that the important thing in the automated sales process is finding a fine balance between customization and automization. So it's really important to, you know, reach out as much as you can, but you need to be reaching the right people. So we're generating leads that are, you know, reaching about, you know, 30 to 40 people a day, and then that's just first round emails. But we have a manual portion, and then they are entered into a drip portion as well. Um, And it's important that, you know, obviously you have to test subject lines, you have to test, you know, the brand proof you're providing, make sure it's relevant to the people that you're speaking to. Because if the email that they're getting just seems like a canned email, it's it's not relevant to them, they're not going to respond. But we've really found that the responses that we get are often on that first email because yeah. it's so tailored to the people that we're speaking to that they feel like it's really Thomas reaching out to them, you know? <laughs> and I mean, a lot of the time it is. We, Thomas still is very, very involved in the sales process. But of course, you know, being a, you know, a startup, we're trying to reach as many people as possible. So the messaging is all very on brand with Dash Hudson and with Thomas's voice, but it has to be automated and uh we've been finding that our uh, process has actually really improved Mm. so when i was starting out maybe in november we were at like about a five percent response rate and um this month about it's shot up like double i'd say Mm -hmm. we're at about a 10 percent response rate right now it's about 12 percent response and 10 percent positive response so that's Mm. people who are actually you know booking meetings Call with and them. talking to. What tools are you using to measure that? You said you were like A-B testing subject lines. Are you like, are you sending that all through HubSpot and Sidekick and all that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So HubSpot, um, it's great. They measure everything that we do. So I can see what's performing in terms of open rates, click-through rates. Hmm. Um, that helps me define, you know, if we need to try something new or what we need to tweak and at what stage in, in the process we need to tweak it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, HubSpot's great for that sidekick. You know, it's a perfect tool to see, you know, who's actually opening, who's looking at what we're doing. That helps me tailor if we need to go harder at someone, if they're interested, but maybe it's not the right time or if they just need another push. Mm-hmm. And I found that something else that's very important is to bri- provide value. So mm-hmm. we often, you know, include content in what we're sending out. So you know, it's less about like, look at us, look at us, look at what we can do and more about how, what can we do to help you? Do you find this interesting? What are your thoughts on Instagram? Um, Cause we always like to learn from the people that we're talking to because that makes our product better. Hmm. And so that's going out to people who kind of fit that target persona of like the, the decision maker yeah, or exactly. the user at, uh, at these yep. agencies. And, and you're, you're putting content in there as well. So how, I guess like, have you been talking to those people and kind of figuring out what they're interested? I mean, that's always the hard thing about content marketing mm. is like, what are people actually interested in yeah. and what's just noise, you know? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we do, we do link in some content from our blog, but that's usually later in the drip process. So the content that, you know, I think the content that performs best for us is pure custom content. So what we do is we actually, it's just like a really good trick. <laughs> it was Michaela's idea. 
But we just oh, we yes, the we screenshots. we screen, <laughs> we screenshot their data from our platform and some of the key data points that we know that they can't get anywhere else. And we show them how, like, we just basically these are questions that they have that they need answered, and we just show them the answers in a screenshot in the email. And right. the and the screenshot, it's not fancy. Like, we have a few lines of text. We say like, here was the results of this. We like literally have a screenshot of our platform inside the email. It's just like dragged and dropped in, and it's just like the response rates on those emails are just crazy. It's interesting. My thought- dangling crack in front of them. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's these are questions yeah. they have, and we're providing One them with answers. Free. Yeah, exa- exactly. Yeah. I mean, words it, are... It books us a lot of calls. <laughs> yeah, words nice. are great, but, you know, you get a, you get hundreds of emails a day. You're not going to read them all, but you open an email, you see visually right in front of you your data in your face. It's kind of hard to say no to, and mm-hmm. it's been one of our su- most successful strategies yeah. in the sales process. Yeah. I once actually uh, wrote a blog post about that. When somebody did that to me, it was an app called Full Story where they uh, basically take video of users using your website mm. without the user yeah, knowing yeah, it's like yeah. track and they the email was like an animated gif of somebody using proposal right yeah <laughs> yeah like, in like bed. click here to see the rest yeah. i was like click yeah and then they follow up an, a day later and yeah. they're like i saw saw you checked it out yeah. and um you must be interested and it was it was a really good sales i'm sure they crush it on that email mm-hmm. yeah oh yeah, yeah absolutely so it sounds like you guys are kind of doing doing something similar yeah but how are you getting the leads like because i know yeah. we've talked before about yeah, like scraping and stuff yeah. like that how yeah i mean yeah. yeah it's interesting like our we're not real like we we're not really doing any scraping anymore no. like or like we're not it's really comes from like it's almost like a curated list of leads like yeah i find i mean if you're just going to reach out to hundreds of non-relevant people it gets you nowhere whereas reaching out to a smaller number of really tailored specific people it's it's better results Mm -hmm. i'm i'm you know looking directly for the people who are going to be using the software and the decision makers and um that's the the lengthiest part for sure is getting those leads but it's worth it it makes a big difference it makes a big difference do you use like linkedin at all yeah linkedin is find their job title all day oh yeah (laughs) and so when you find somebody who you're like okay they're they're in the right type of company they're in the right position or the role in the company that they would make a good lead um, do you reach out through LinkedIn or do you try to find like their email address somehow? I get their email address because we have found LinkedIn. No one responds. Yeah. It's uh, too impersonal. Mm. I mean, if you take the time to get somebody's email, I think it says something. It, no, I mean, it doesn't mean that much to everyone, but getting the email, you know, taking the time to write a customized email, it makes a big difference for mm. sure. Yeah. And you find those through, I guess there's tools out there that you can find email addresses. There's tools, but, you know, if you spend enough time doing it, you kind of get the hang of how to do it. You know, you kind of find a format for someone in the company. You use, I use tools like Cellhack. There's also Datanizer. Some people use that as well. Um, Those just scan through, you know, servers and try to match the emails and confirm for you. It makes it faster. I've been using Cellhack. It's, It's going pretty well. But I also use, like, really basic stuff like mail tester which is free which kind of just you know confirms or denies whether something's correct and hmm. it's better to get a confirmation or like a almost sure thing rather than you know get a bounce wasting your time so yeah um and you guys use hubspot crm we yes. do yeah. yeah okay so you tie together like hubspot's your thing like it's, yeah it's everything it's yeah. i mean hubspot's I mean, it's great. I mean, they had some downtime issues recently, which I'm a little pissed off about. Yeah, but some bugs here and there. <laughs> but uh, but it's not it, a cheap tool. It's no, it's not. But I mean, you know, all praise to Volta. Um, mm-hmm. We were a Volta company and still a member of Volta, being the startup incubator here. Maybe you've talked about it on the show before. Yeah. Um, but we are a former uh, tenant and still a member of the network, so we got a pretty sweet deal on HubSpot. That's good. Um, so yeah, so it's it's not too expensive this year. It will be more expensive la- next year. Yeah, well, um, it'll be at like ten million AR. Yeah, yeah. So it's so. like it'll be a drop in the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's very, but it's great. It's very effective. I mean, we're not really, to be honest, using the marketing side. We're using it for the CRM hmm. um, and the sales automation stuff. I think like this is like a really interesting choice that we just made strategically. Is based on our customer. We said like we're not gonna like dump a bunch of energy into marketing like we do a lot of content creation but it's like that's an investment kind of in the future um we knew that we only had enough time basically if we were going to survive as a company like we had to go out and tackle it with people with sales Mm -hmm. and 
Um, so we, yeah, we don't really use the marketing automation all that much because we don't have dollars to put behind marketing. Yeah. Um, we're focused on sales. Um, that said, we've been really happy because in the last few weeks, like our marketing's really started to kick in, which is super exciting. Like the content's starting to pay off, mm, you know, yeah. the distribution strategies are starting to help. Wow. And so we're starting to see inbound start to grow. Mm, um, nice. Or mostly organic. So, um, and then like word of mouth and all kinds of stuff is starting to happen. Um, whereas marketing pre, you know, 2016 was just like non existent. What do, so you said distribution, distribution strategy yep. is starting to pay off. So that's like the hardest part of content. Yep. It's kind of easy to make content, but then yep. getting people to actually read it is difficult. So what are, what are you doing, I guess, in the distribution side of things? Yeah. I mean, it's still very much a work in progress, but, um, you know, like this is like these, this is like kind of content marketing 101, but like create great content, like spend the time creating really good content, know what people kind of want to hear about, like try to share something maybe that's a unique insight to you. So you're not just listicling all day. Yeah. Um, and I think then like learning how to like leverage that content in multiple ways. So, you know, we'll do, um, you know, obviously we do on our blog, but we'll, you know, we'll often rewrite that content for Quora. Um, we slide share most of our content. We've had a lot of success on slide share. Um, you get di great distribution. We'll create po LinkedIn posts out of it. We'll create medium posts out of the same content. Oh, wow. Um, like we'll, we'll like, and it hasn't seemed to hurt us from an SEO perspective. Um, but we'll like over time, we'll like duplicate the content out into like additional channels yeah. just to take the bump off of that because the chances of breaking out on SEO for any one particular content piece of content are so small anyway it's like why not take the kind of bump that you get on the distribution to the other channel right yeah it's kind of like if a bit of a near term later yeah it's like as... maybe it's maybe then it's not a big deal you know plus i wouldn't think that uh that's like organic search is a primary driver for you guys it's not leads, so. no i mean we've written a few actually we stole a, pay, a, play, a page from your playbook oh yeah we wrote some competitor stuff oh did you yeah, yeah nice. and it's crushing it like we get yeah, we probably get 10, about 10, like, pretty highly qualified, uh, like, contacts coming through per day on this one blog post that we wrote about our competitor's pricing. That's awesome. So for people listening, that's basically writing a page on your site that compares you with the competitor, knowing that a lot of people will write, you know, whatever, Proposify versus yep. competitor yeah. name. Or here. in our case, it's competitor pricing, competitor pricing. That's what people are searching because none of our competitors put their pricing uh, on, interesting. on on the interweb. It's a sneaky tactic, but man, it works. Super sneaky. <laughs> and it's really targeted traffic too. If my competitors are listening, Don't love do you that. guys. <laughs> they're going to write a, a Dash Hudson article like right now. Yeah, as soon totally. As to yeah, this. as soon as they're off the phone. Yeah. So where I guess like what are the next steps for 2016? Where do you guys want to take uh, the business? Do you plan to hire more, get a, a bigger sales team? I mean, we've I think like we think more about just growing the business than growing the team. Like we've got such a great team and um, we've accomplished a lot in a really short period of time. I mean, pivot last summer. We're gonna hit some pretty meaningful revenue targets next month um that will position us well for the future and i you know i believe we've got the opportunity to you know take it probably another milestone further based on kind of what we have so we're just really focused on like you know we we feel like we really understand why and how we bring value um especially versus other solutions so i think we can articulate that really well to customers so i think that just means having that conversation with more customers um and then, like, we're really focused on treating our current customers really well. Like, we have great brands that we work with, um, brands that, like, you know, are seen as leaders in kind of this form of marketing. And, and we want to make sure that we're, you know, we treat them really well, that we continue to listen to them, improve the product, and, um, you know, and learn from them, right? Like, learn from them. And, I mean, because they're the customers we have, their word of mouth and like their, you know, their reference points are kind of what's going to carry us forward into the future. Um, so yeah, just focused on, on growing business and, you know, working with great companies. Cool. Well, it's, it sounds like an awesome product. I've never actually seen it. I have to see like, a oh, demo I definitely got to take you through a demo. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Did you design it? I wish I could take credit for that. <laughs> we, we, get, so we started a Slack channel where we write down all of like the really funny customer quotes that we get. And these are some very interesting ones. Like we actually had a customer say, OMG, 
And like, just like, like, how much is this absolutely gorgeous piece of software going to cost me? You know, just stuff like that, like, which is really thrilling when you hear it. Um, You know, so we've, yeah, we've, we've taken the time to build a product that looks and functions beautifully. And I mean, it resonates with customers for sure. I mean, this is, uh, I think we're probably running out of time, but I wanted to say too that um, if it's a beautiful product, you're, I mean, you're selling to lifestyle, you're selling to marketing agencies or lifestyle brands or mm-hmm. marketing agencies that represent lifestyle brands. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said for style and aesthetics and beauty. Exactly. Right? Absolutely. I could, I mean, one of the, we're, they're not a customer yet, but I had a chat with them last week and, you know, her comment was, you know, all of the other analytics platforms that I've seen are so ugly. Instagram is so beautiful. Why would anybody do that? You know, it's just kind of like, and it was just kind of like, but to us, when we started, it was so obvious that the people who were going to use this want to see something beautiful. And so that was like a really core part of, of like our belief in what the product needed to be from the very beginning. So, I mean, none of this is magic. It's just kind of trying to, trying to choose the right things to do, you know? Um, it seems like it's common sense that you would put effort into the design of your product and make it beautiful, but so many people don't. Yeah. You and guys do. You guys have a beautiful product. And and that actually, like when we survey our customers and ask them why they, you know, signed up or why they chose us, it's often, I mean, that's a reoccurring theme is like everybody, other products don't look as good. Yours looks better. And it's like, even at the enterprise level, even when you're dealing with big companies, it used to be almost a cliche that like enterprise software look like shit right? yeah like salesforce i think still looks like shit it although. does mm-hmm. i think they're planning a redesign or something but it, it almost was like oh if it's consumer brand or if it's small business make it look good mm. but enterprise they don't really care about mm. it also they, depends who the founders are i mean if you think about it i mean a lot of uh, apps are built by developers mm. or, or who are founders and they build it from the back forward yeah you know and i mean with kyle being one of the founders he's a great designer right so mm. i mean we designed it from the front back yeah who designed your product anyway um, our designer, Anthony. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Full time one? yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was, he was one of our first, uh, first hires. Um, we thought that was really important. So, I mean, yeah, like that blend of on the product team, you know, my CTO Tomac runs back end and innovation. We have Sholly who does mobile and front end. Um, and then Anthony who does design and that like that trio really knows. How we, and then like Myself and Mikhail and Jenny and Michaela feeding the customer feedback and kind of the product kind of response mm-hmm. back into that team. I mean, yeah, that that's such an important loop to get right. Yeah. Um, because that's what ensures that you make the right decisions and you build things well. Um, so yeah, that that's I think that's the most important thing. I mean, so we I mean we knew that being design led, especially since we came from consumer, like it had to be beautiful. Like we, and we branded ourselves as a consumer company. So now we're a B2B company that still looks and feels like a consumer brand. (laughs) And it just seems to work for us. You know, like even the name, like it doesn't make any sense for an enterprise software company to be called Dash Hudson, but whatever. It's it's obviously uh, resonating with like the people who are buying, buying from you. It's like an unintentional differentiator. Yeah. It's funny how that works sometimes. Yep. Uh, Thomas Michaela, thank you so much for being on the show. Pleasure to have you. Thank you guys. Thanks. This is awesome. Thanks, guys. All right. We're going to include some links in the show notes to Dash Hudson and probably some other things. So check that out. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Beans. So Kevin's, uh, Kevin's tooting a lot over there. Just call me gas. Trying to hide it. Metamorphous. You said you were trying Maximus. to hide it and I just said, no, I'm calling you out on it. Let it rip. Yeah. I was reading, uh, I'll read it for the listeners. If you haven't seen it, uh, the great um, Matthew Inman from the Oatmeal, the Oatmeal comics are always hilarious. He wrote one about the analysis of a sneeze versus the analysis of a toot. So his analysis of a sneeze was your heart stops, your face explodes, boogers and disease spray out of your mouth at 70 miles an hour. And what are the results? You get germs on other people and they respond with bless you and aw, you poor thing. And yet uh, the analysis of a toot is it relieves gastric distress. Uh, It feels nice. It sounds nice. It releases a tiny cloud of methane. And what's the result of that? You do something harmless to other people and they respond with, I don't love you anymore. And Matt, I want a divorce. (laughs) Is that my future? (laughs) (laughs) Better cut back on the beans. (laughs) You better. My new diet, I'm eating a lot of beans. Mm, beans are so food. good. They've it, it's so got healthy. so many nutrients in yeah, them. Yeah. You get protein. You they get ton of everything. Them. Yep. Potassium, probably. I'm just saying that. Yep. And they create methane. I mean, we can maybe fuel the world with it someday. Yeah. I remember reading a scientific analysis of why uh, beans make you fart. 
way. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I forget it all now, but okay. it was interesting at the time. What it does to your ass, it's it's incredible. Mm. Very interesting. Hope you guys enjoy that. I know nobody <laughs> listens to the end part of these uh, podcasts, so and if they do, they aren't going to anymore. This is the last time they're ever listening to the conclusion. So rate and review us on the iTunes store and get in touch to leave a question for us to answer. Please send your questions. And also let us know if you want to be a featured guest on Agencies Drinking Beer. Beer.